I am a, not only a believer, but I'm, I'm following him. I'm following what he said in his, in his word. In Romans 10, 13, it says, For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 16, 31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So we're going to talk about salvation today. I know growing up in the church, I was the leader in the clubhouse of asking for salvation pretty much like three times a week because I was scared. I, I heard about hell. I didn't want to go there. And so all the time, all the time, I was always asking for uh, forgiveness and, and salvation. Now, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that repetitively. And um, Ma Matthew 6, verse 7 and 8 talks about when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, okay? For they think that they, if many words are heard, that they will be accepted. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. I don't want anyone to raise your hand or raise your hand on Zoom, but how many of you have doubt about your salvation, where it's something that just, it kicks your butt? You're just like, I just don't know. If I got hit by a truck, am I am I going to am I going to heaven? Will I be there? We're going to talk about that today. And so, if you guys recall a verse that we did uh, last year is Hebrews four sixteen, talking about let us then approach God's throne with confidence. Do you remember that? With confidence, being like, you know what, Lord, I don't like what's going on in my life, but you know what, I'm going to trust you. I have confidence that you're going to deliver. That was my prayer for many, many years. And there's nothing wrong with that prayer saying, you know what, Lord, I don't like what you're doing. But you must follow it up, guys, with, but Lord, I trust you. Lord, That's trust what's you. very difficult because uh, it's hard to trust. It's hard to trust when we can't see our Savior, when we can't hear from him often. So anyways, when I say today's a special morning, um, we're, we're going to talk about a wholehearted life. And I want to bring up Tom Gansfried up to the front here, and he's going to share some words about a wholehearted life. So let me let me pray for Tom, um, and then we'll, we'll talk about Tom uh, at the end of the morning. But um, let me uh, pray for him as he as he comes up. And, and guys, be all here for the next 20, 30 minutes. So let me pray for you, Tom. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for all that you're doing. Uh, be with the men here in this room as we talk about a wholehearted life. And what does it mean to be sure of knowing where we're going to go when it's our time to graduate here from this earth? Father, be with Tom. Help him as he uh, talks a little bit about a wholehearted life. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Bobby. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Let me get this thing for the way. Oh, I count it a privilege to to be able to come and, and to share a few minutes with you. And um, I asked Bobby over a year ago if I could speak today. He said no, but I I came anyway. And I not only came, I, I brought everybody that, that would listen. And I'm going to pick on my friend. Uh, um, what's your name again? Doug. Hey, Doug. Well, he's Dwight. You're Doug. So my wife and I are at dinner with Doug and, and his wife, and and I know Doug, and you can tease with Doug. And so I said, hey, Doug, I'm going to give you a choice, okay? You can either come to practice on June 3rd and listen to me, or I'm going to give you my Amway spiel. <laughs> Doug's already heard the Amway spiel, so he's here today. So welcome. In the book of Joshua, Caleb and Joshua are described as loving God wholeheartedly. I want to talk a little bit about what that means for our lives. I'm actually going to begin with a run-up, the quickest run-up through the Old Testament that, that you've ever heard. So God promises to Abraham that he's going to give him a nation. Life moves on. The nation of Israel grows and grows, has its ups, has its downs, ends up in Egypt. They become slaves for 400 years in Egypt. 
And that's kind of where this story begins. So Moses is used to bring his nation, his people, out of Egypt and I'll say toward the promised land, not into the promised land. And so I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, know the story that uh, God parts the Red Sea, the nation Israel goes through the Red Sea, and they come into what is uh, today uh, the Sinai Peninsula. And so in, we know about them. Um, you, you've heard of Israel wandering the desert for 40 years. That wasn't God's original plan. God's original plan was to, can you go ahead to the next slide? I'm, I'm a line ahead of you. Sorry about that. Um, God's original plan was to bring the nation Israel into Sinai and teach them. He was going to take a year. So there's the Sinai Peninsula. He was going to take a year. Because remember, they've been, they've been captives. They've been in slavery for 400 years. So he's going to use this time to harden them, to get them battle-tested, to get ready to take the promised land. Because if you go back to Genesis, the original promise was that the nation of Israel was going to be given a land flowing with milk and honey. And I hadn't really thought about that too much. Land flowing with milk and honey. You know what that means? That means it's a land that already has agriculture. It's a land that already has livestock. It's a land that has fortified cities. It has buildings. It has people who want to keep their livestock and their agriculture. And so as God is giving them this land, it's not going to come easily or cheap. So one year, okay? We'll march around, do this, do that, get ready. That year is coming to an end, and Moses sends out 12, 12 spies, one, from, one leader from each uh, family in Israel. And they go out for 40 days, they go into the promised land to bring back a report. Okay, we've been told it's a land filled with milk and honey, go find out, bring back the news. So 10 of them come back and say, yep. Yeah, it was a land, it was filled with milk and honey. It was beautiful, the crops are great, everything's good. But man, oh man, are there some huge people there. And they're strong and the cities are fortified. And frankly, Moses, they're going to kick our butts. That was 10 of them. I'm going to quote Caleb on his response. Caleb said to Moses, let us go up at once and take the land, for we are well able to take it in battle. So um, Caleb and Joshua came back with a report. Yep, milk and honey. Yep, it's all there. And we've got this. God's got our back. We've got this. Well, this is Old Testament. God has his moments. And he, he sees this report, and he says, no, 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 no. I'm not going to have it. Because of this report, you spent 40 days spying out the land, nation of Israel. You're now going to spend 40 years wandering this peninsula. 40 years. And a couple more things. One, and I have the, the scripture up there at the top. It's from Deuteronomy 1-2. From where they were in Mount Sinai to where they needed to be, is an 11 day journey. They could walk there in 11 days, and it's going to take them 40 years to make that trek. And then the other thing is that God said, nobody who is over 20 years old is going to go into the promised land, except for Caleb and Joshua. So God had a plan, He was working it. The lack of faith interrupted it, and it led to what we know in our stories. So now we come to Joshua. Moses is a um, whole other sermon. Moses is not going to go into the promised land anymore. Didn't make it. Fell short on some areas. He wanted to. God got him to the precipice, and he could look down, and he could see it, and he asked God, could it at least just take my body there? I'm going to die. Just take my body Plant me in the promised land. That's all I ask. So God honored that. God did that. But Joshua became the leader 
the warrior, the, the champion, the strategist to be able to get the, the nation of Israel um, into the promised land. Pop quiz, where do you find Joshua in the Bible? More specific, you're, come on, you're Bible scholars. There's a book called Joshua. Come on, guys, work with me here, guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> trick question. Okay, so Joshua is in the book of Joshua. He's also in Exodus. He's also in Numbers. He's also in Deuteronomy. I mean, he is all over. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch. And that's the history that I've just described. In fact, a couple chapters in Deuteronomy, um, if you want a, the Cliff Notes version, I think it's 24 and 25. Moses gives two sermons near the time of his death, and he lays out everything that's happened in those two chapters. So good reading. Okay, so now God commissions Joshua. God's got a plan. And I've got a couple of verses here. I'm going to ask uh, Steve. Would you read these two verses for us? Joshua 1, 6 through 8. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers. My bad. That I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but shall, you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Thank you, Steve. Okay, so Joshua is going to lead the nation of Israel into the promised land. And as they do this, so you're familiar, and this was new to me uh, just not that long ago, we know about God parting the Red Sea. Boom, they will go through dry land. Did the same thing with the Jordan River. Dried it up. The nation Israel went through the, the Jordan River on dry land. Now, <laughs> now they're in this land of milk and honey and fortified cities and people that want to keep their milk and honey. And it, it, it goes into seven years of battles that Joshua leads. Now, Joshua had his ear to the Lord, and the Lord gave different instructions as were needed for each battle. We're going to talk in a few minutes about our own battles. The Lord gives us each different instructions as to how to overcome our battles, how to be victorious in our battles. The first city they came to was Jericho. And if you grew up in Sunday school, you probably sang, you know, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Jericho, okay, y'all know that. So smart. And the walls come tumbling down. So this was all God. This was, dudes, this is all you're going to do. You're going to go and you're going to march around the city again and again and again. And then, boom, the, the walls are going to fall. But here's the deal. It, God makes the rules, right? God said, the plunder of Jericho is mine. You don't get any of it. So, they battle, you know, they, they don't battle. They march, walls fall down, God gets the plunder, and they get ready for their next battle. Their next battle, they go to Ai. And Joshua's got a plan. He's a warrior. He's a strategist. He knows how to do it. They go to Ai, and they get their butts handed to them. And they flee back, and, and uh, Joshua's, God, what happened? I thought you were with us. I thought you were part of this. And God goes, Remember the rules about Jericho? Yeah, you don't take any plunder. Someone took plunder. And so they went through na very strategically, nation by nation, family by family, tent by tent. And Achan had decided, yeah, this stuff's a little too good to leave back here. I'm going to take a little bit of it. And he hid it in his tent. I think he buried it under his tent. Well, Achan met his demise. The nation Israel repented. They went back to battle. And this is just a partial list. But in those seven years, they had, I think, 31 battles that they fought. And I bolded, you I can't really see them. I bolded a few of the, of the cities here. Um, and the reason I did that is a few of the cities that are listed there are listed there more than once. And when we equate it 
to our battles. Sometimes the battles that we face, we face those more than once as well. So I want to now show, you, you're very familiar with this. So let's look at this from the standpoint of, okay, Joshua was given instructions to fight battle after battle. Well, we face battle after battle. And God gives us instructions how to face those battles. And, and we'll talk a little bit about those. We talk about, we talk about those every week. But here's the thing. If practice throughout the week, many men are having victories. I love hearing men talk about their victories. It's so refreshing at table time when guys are talking about, you know, it's been this many months that I've been sober and I haven't looked at pornography or I haven't drunk or, you know, I've been going to CR now for 12 weeks. They're just, there's tremendous victories that are happening. Victories over drugs, alcohol, pornography, anger is lessening, marriages are improving. These testimonies bring newness to practice and we praise God for them. But we also have defeats and we need accountability and support of one another. Just like Joshua's battles, we often fight the same battles over and over and over and over. You get the point, and over. So I have a few questions. Are we having more victories and fewer defeats? Think about that. Think about the last few weeks in your life, last few months, last few years, whatever reference point you want to give it. Are you having more victories and fewer defeats? I can assure you, in fact, looking around the room, I know there are men in this room who are having more victories and fewer defeats in their life. Are we, oh, I hate this one. Who put this in here? Are we seeking God's help before and during the battle or just after? Do we meet up with a guy afterwards? Hey, how'd your week go? Oh, it was okay. How'd your week go? Oh, it was pretty good. Hey, how about those diamondbacks? You know? Or are we or are we calling someone? And and by we, I'm leaving myself out of this because I'm horrible at this. This is all on you all, because you have to you have to listen to this. We have an opportunity to call a brother and say, you know what? My wife's going to be out of town all weekend. This is when I really struggle. Can you support me? We can preempt the sin, guys. We can win that battle before we even face that battle. And then my last question, are we living a wholehearted life? And so that begs the question, what is a wholehearted life? And this is, this is my description of a wholehearted life. And I'm going to read through them, and then I'll kind of cover them. It's to know Jesus, to have an assurance of salvation, to have evidence of salvation, to have no plan B, and to live well and die ready. So what do these things mean? No Jesus. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one. We talk about this one every week. We don't assume that everybody in this room and everybody on, on, on Zoom has said yes to Jesus. And so that's fundamental. None of, none of the rest of this will make sense if you don't know Jesus. And if you don't, this is a safe environment. You can talk to guys. You can talk at table time. You can come up to one of us afterwards. You can say, hey, you know what? I just don't know. I just don't know what does that mean. Help me out with this. It's it's, it's we overcomplicated, uh, but you do need to know. You do need to know Jesus. The next one is: Do you have an assurance of salvation? And you might not know what that means. So I want to dig into this one a little bit further. Um, I have a picture here of a stool. If I walked up to that stool and I sat down. I would have probably 100%, close to 100% assurance that if I sat on that stool, it could support my weight, right? Make sense? How about this next picture? Not so much. So how much assurance would I have that if I sat in that chair, it would hold my weight? <laughs> no, I pulled it out of Google. <laughs> so 
My question to you today, and this is really my bottom line question of, of this talk, how assured are you of your salvation? There are men in this room and watching on Zoom who have said yes to Jesus, but are not 100%, 100% sure that if they died today, they would be with him. And you know, guys, that can affect your ministry. You can be talking to your neighbor and say, let me tell you what Jesus did in my life, and I hope someday that I get to be with him. That, that just waters down a testimony. So uh, what, what you might hear is, um, I hope if I died today, I'd be with Jesus. I hope if I sat in that previous folding chair, it would hold up my weight. We don't have to hope, guys. We don't, we don't have to, to guess at it. The Bible is so clear that if we have accepted Jesus, we have an assurance of salvation. So there's a couple scriptures that I pulled up, and I'm going to read them. Uh, the first one, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, is from the New Living um, Translation, and says, And now you Gentiles also have heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed, in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he purchased us to be his own people. He did so. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. So I, I pulled out a couple of these. I want us to read these two together. I, I personalized them. And so follow me and, and read this first one. When I believed in Christ, he identified me as his own. That was really good. <laughs> it's probably better to meet in a small room, Bobby. <laughs> that was strong. But I want to do it again. And here's the reason why. I really believe that there are men in this room that need to hear themselves say that. And I want to provide a, a safety net for them. I want your voices to be loud enough that they can say it loudly enough that they can hear themselves. Otherwise, it's going to be really embarrassing if they're yelling, blurting it out and everybody goes, you what? So let's read that again. And please, any of you, any of you that walked into this room saying, I just, I hope, I said yes to Jesus, and I hope that if I died today, I would be with him. Please read this and make it your own. When I believed in Christ, he identified me as his own. And then let's read this other one. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give me the inheritance he promised. Okay? Took a little bit of a liberty there with the word of God, but I wanted us to, to make that our own. And then 1 John 5, 13, I have written this to you who believe. John wrote to believers in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. These are just two examples, guys, of, of how clear that is in the Bible. The next one is, do you have evidence of salvation? And we talk about this one a lot in practice. Um, Bobby touched on it just a few minutes ago. We talk about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know, do we um, go on our way? If, if you're married, does your wife say, you know, something, my, my husband is different because of, of something going on in his life, and, and uh, they, they recognize that. Um, there are lots. In fact, the article that I took this from had like 12 or 14 different things, and um, I knew I wouldn't have the time for that, but do you have evidence of salvation in your life? Do you admit and confess your sin? First John 1 John 1.8 says, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Do you walk the walk versus talking the talk? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth so that we will be confident when we stand before God. There's that word confident again. And then the last one, do you experience victory in your Christian walk? For every child, defeat, every child of God defeats this evil world and we achieve this victory through our faith. 
A lot more could be said about evidence of salvation. I'll leave that for, for the, the following weeks, but um, it's got to be there, guys. Like Bobby asked the question, you know, is it once and for all when you accept Jesus? Is it walking it out daily in your life? And the answer is yes, it's both. You need to know Jesus, you need to have assurance of salvation, and you need to, need to have, uh, uh, you know, evidence of it. Next one, have no plan B. How do we remember our life before Jesus? And more importantly, do we leave open a plan to go back? Yeah, if this Christian thing doesn't work out for me, there's always, you know, for one year, God supplied all of the needs of, for the nation Israel. The Bible says that he rained manna from heaven, which they collected in the morning and they, they baked it like bread. That wasn't good enough. They were complaining. So God gave them quail. God gave them a pillar of fire by night for, for light and security. He gave them clouds by day for uh, keep them comfort, comfortable in, in the heat. And what, did, what was the response of the Israelis, of, of the nation of Israel? Wah, 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 wah. Moses, did you bring us out to the desert to die? We had it so much better when we were slaves in Egypt. We had smoothies in the morning. We had a refreshing drink before our steak dinner. We were sleeping on our Sealy Posturepedic mattresses. That's how they remembered slavery. How do we remember our life before Christ when we face a test? When we have to decide, is it going to be plan A or plan B? Do we say, God, did you just make me a Christian just to be miserable? In my pre-Christ life, I worked 30-hour weeks. I fished every weekend. We never had any family squabbles. Is that how we remember our pre-life? Um, Chuck is going to read a couple uh, portions of scripture that talk about uh, people who did not have a plan B. This is from uh, John 6, 66 through 68. After this, Jesus telling the crowd who wants bread that he is the bread of life. Many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know you, that you are the Holy One of God. And then uh, Joshua 24, 15. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. To live a wholehearted life, you cannot have an escape clause. And the last one is live well, die ready. This comes from a friend, uh, our pastor in Olympia. And, and it was basically just that. If you, if you live the principles that we've talked about here, Jesus could come and you'd be ready. And there's a legend that's told of St. Francis of Assisi. And one afternoon, Francis was out and he was hoeing his garden. And this monk comes up to him and says, Francis, if you knew Jesus was coming today, what would you do? And Francis thought for a moment. He said, I'd hoe my garden. Guys, if you knew Jesus was coming this afternoon, would you do anything different in your life? Or are you living today ready that that could happen and it wouldn't change? wouldn't change anything. You would just, you would just be glorified this afternoon. That's the wholehearted life. That's my definition of a wholehearted life. I'd like to talk to you about someone who had a wholehearted life. Many of you know that my son Philip died almost four years ago. He was a special young man who I would say lived a wholehearted life. He lived well. 
and he died ready. <clears throat> we were very close, but after he died, I learned more about his admiration for Joshua. And it's not that I didn't have some clues before. His son, my grandson, is Joshua. <laughs> Duh. Um, on his casket, Jennifer put the Bible, and the Bible was open to Joshua chapter 1. And Steve earlier read Joshua chapter 1, 8. And I had, that was one of the first scriptures I memorized as a, as a new believer. And I'm sure I read it before, but that week, Joshua 1.9 just popped off the pages. Not only for me, but for Jen and for the grandkids. And he says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified or dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. So I, I brought a few pictures of Philip just because I wanted to talk about him. I, I know they're clustered. I had a hard time making decisions. Um, but I wanted to show a couple things. I wanted to show that, that he loved to have fun. The next slide will show that. Don't go there yet. The next slide will show that a little bit more. I also wanted to show, if you can see it, this picture of him. He was as intense as he was playful. And so... Yeah, and then go on to the next slide. And he lived at the level of his kids. He would get down, he would talk to them eye to eye, and he just he adored his family. And then this last picture, that's, that's the last picture of Philip on earth. So <clears throat> when Philip was 19 years old, God spoke to him and said, I want you to write a book. At 19 years old, I want you to write a book. I want you to tell males how to be men. And life happened. He went on. He went through college, finished college. He got married. He had a couple kids. So fast forward to January of 2019. And he lived in Orlando. We lived here. And Philip and I communicated often. And and he reaches out to me January of 19 and says, Dad, God told me this is the year. Get the book done. Cool. Go for it. You're 31 years old. I, you know, my, my loving, caring, supportive dad head is going, I think you have a lot more to say at 31 than you did at 19. But I'm not God, so <laughs> you listen to God. So January, he says, this is the year I've got to get it done. July... He reaches out to me and goes, hey, Dad, Jen and the kids are gone for a week. They've gone to Ohio. Um, this is the week I'm going to get it done. If I finish the book, can I email it to you? Would you read it, offer you know, your thoughts, and then send it back? And I go, yeah, of course I would. And he did that with a few people. And then he compiled and changed where he felt change needed to be made. August 24th, 2019, he self-published through Amazon, August 24th, September 5th, he died in his sleep with no warning. So God had it, and that was one of the things we could cling to. God knew. God wasn't caught off guard, but then we had a choice to make, and I go back to the point <clears throat> of having a, a plan B. Maria and I had to decide, okay, does this change anything with us? Does this change anything with our relationship with Christ? Or do we just go forward and say, God, we don't understand it. In fact, I'll be honest with you, I hate it, but we trust you. Philip's heart was to speak to men Frankly, Philip's heart was to slap men upside the head and challenge them to be godly leaders, <clears throat> godly leaders in the home and the community. His style was direct, and he kept the message simple. And so I, I pulled a few of the themes of the book just to real, give you a real, real, real brief recap. Um, one is misconception of manhood. 
Question is, what does it take to be a male? What, white, white chromosome? What does it take to be a man? And that, that's what he's talking about. Talks about the humility of the hammer. He says, you're a tool. We're all tools. We're designed to be used in a specific way for a specific reason. Think about this room that you walked into today. Who, and you can show hands if you want, who walked into this room and said, wow, I wonder what kind of hammers they used. So the humility of the hammer. It was needed. It helped build this room, but it's not what we admire about the room. It's just how God uses us. And then here's the, oh, no, I'm jumping ahead. Uncommon common sense. You know, he's talking to our culture. He's not Bible thumping in this book. He's talking to our culture. He's using Bible references, but he's not, thus saith the Lord. So uncommon common sense, that just flies in the face of our culture. He's talking about situational awareness. He's talking about understanding and discernment. The foundation, and this is, this is the crux, manhood doesn't happen by accident. Males, we have to learn to be men. And that's what he's getting at. It can teach men to be men. It can also help young women know what to look for in a man. And here's where I was going before. This is the best evidence that this book was written for, for men. On the back right here, you can't see it, but it's bold. It says, this book can be read in an hour. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> with lots of pictures in the book, wide margins, big font. Um, yeah, he knew he knew our attention span. So there was another man in my life who um, who is still living, but is living wholeheartedly. His name is Scott Smith, and I was a junior at UC Santa Barbara, and I was a mess. I was just um, yeah, I had no business being there. But the Holy Spirit drew a very hungry heart. And I saw Scott's life. We were in a, this apartment complex, but we didn't have kitchens. It was kind of like an off-campus dorm. You had your room, but then you went downstairs to the dining room to eat. And so from September to early spring, I would see Scott Smith there. And he wasn't handing out scripture cards. And he wasn't probably wasn't even holding a Bible. But he was living a life that just made me hunger. Just, I want some of that. I didn't know what that was, but I want some of that. That school year, 46 years ago, I accepted Jesus into my heart as a result of a young man's wholehearted life. Scott went on to, um, he had a full, full career in education. And then when they retired, he and his wife, Petey, went to Asia. And they're missionaries in Asia today, still giving his life to Christ. So in conclusion, help me in. look at that, look at the time. In conclusion, do you see people in your life, I'm sorry, do people in your life see you and recognize a wholehearted believer? In other words, do they say what he's got? I want some of that. I hope this gave you a little bit of an idea of what it means and how you can have it. And I want to end by giving each person a copy of Philip's book. Yes, would you go ahead and start that? Um, some of you bought the book three years ago, and I get that. Um, go ahead and take another copy. If, if you know a man, young man, young lady in your life, right as graduation gift. Um, yeah. <laughs> If, yeah, Father's Day, whoa, good answer. So if you have someone that you know that you could gift it to, if you already have the book, um, I want you to be able to do that. If you haven't, um, after the edits, to be, to be honest, it's a little bit more than a one-hour read, but not much more. It, it's a pretty simple read. So um, I just want to thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Um, for those of you on Zoom that couldn't hear, Glenn read this book three years ago and got nothing out of it, so he's asking for his money back.
Let's thank Tom, guys. Thank Tom for. So not only the, the, the what I said uh, to start the morning, this is a special morning, not only because I knew Tom was going to give out uh, the book that his, his son wrote, but the other reason why this is Tom's last Saturday with us, he is moving to Colorado and um, you're leaving when? June 15th, but we're going to California in between. Okay. So, so, you know, I, I just knowing the story of Philip, I got to meet Philip once and I actually was with Tom on a, uh, the day before he got the news, we went to lunch. We were talking about practice. We were talking about work. It was great. We were laughing. And then just a couple hours later, I wake up to a text saying I'm on a flight. My son is with Jesus. And it was a horrific day um and to 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 see a man lose a, a 30 33 year old son 32 32 year old boy suddenly and so that's why he's so passionate about are you living a wholehearted life where are you at man i love how he put up the battles that joshua had you know some some Sometimes we read the Old Testament and we're just like, okay, what the heck does this mean? Where's this going? I don't even know how to pronounce this, this warrior or this town. And it was battle after battle after battle that these people had to endure and go through for their family and for their livelihood. And then I love how Tom put our battles up, right? The, the Jesus over everything battles. What, what, is your, what, what is just kicking your butt right now? Is it your marriage? Is it just an addiction to something? Is it just anger and you at a flip of a switch, you just lose it and your wife is frustrated with your anger problem. Your, your kids see it. You're, you're clicking on porn and how your marriage is eroding because of that uh, drugs or alcohol. What, what is your battle? And are can you live a wholehearted life? I do fret. I do fret that I will get a call that someone in this room or someone on zoom is, has graduated. And now we got to plan a memorial service. We all know what's going to happen. The uh, old friend used to say the mortality rate still hovering around 100%. Right? It's still, still, still there. And it's like, so guys, are you ready? Do you know what's going to happen? Can you live a wholehearted life? We train and we practice men to help each other. Like, come on, let's go. If you haven't given your life to Christ, I mean, we don't, we don't mess around with this stuff. There's only, there's two places you're going to go or one of two places you're going to go. You're either going to go to heaven and be with him in, 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 in heaven forever, or you're going to be in hell. There's no purgatory. There's no, there's no middle ground. It's one or the other. And so if you have doubt, if you're just like, you know what, I, I just don't know. And you've never repented. You've never prayed the prayer of salvation of Lord. I, I need you to change me. I'm, I'm a messed up man. Now you're still going to be messed up after you say this prayer. Take it from me. But if you've never said the prayer of salvation, how can you live a wholehearted life? You, you're not going to be able to, Tom even said it, Jesus, knowing Jesus is first. And then if you don't know Jesus, the I think the other five bullet points aren't, they, they don't matter because you don't know Jesus. So anyways, I hope this lesson helped you today. We're going to go to table time. We have a couple of questions. Um, I think that's it. Um, but yeah, Tom, you've been a faithful leader uh, for me, of these seven years, uh, either in the room or on Zoom, you've done both. And I just publicly wanted to thank you in front of all these men for being a man. Yes. <laughs> and and there there are a lot of Toms in this room. I, I want to thank you guys. We we need a bunch more Toms. We we got a we got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of hurting men out there. You know, a lot of people ask me about. In fact, Brim Hall. My the chiropractor I went to on Wednesday, he was asking me, why do I do this? And I never tell him uh, because, you know, I'm trying to point him to Jesus. I mean, I'll, I'll eventually get there, of course. But usually I say, well, because there's men out there that are frustrated, hurting, tired, angry, alone. You, you just mentioned those five right away. It's like, hey, we come together on Saturday mornings. We go hard for 90 minutes because men are hurting. Men are tired. Men are alone. Men are afraid. Men are, men are just are, have so many issues, and this is why we come together and we help each other. So um, let's um, let me pray. Close us out. We're going to go to table time. We go uh, right till eight thirty.
Uh, if you need to go a little longer, you can go a little longer. If you have to leave, leave quietly, but please do your best to stay. Guys on Zoom, stay with uh, Tad and George and go through the questions. Um, Tom, thank you. And let me pray and let's answer some of these questions and uh, we'll see you guys next Saturday. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for Tom. Thank you for Philip's life and and the impact that he had at just 32-year-old uh, man and the 32 years he had on this earth. Thank you that we learned about Joshua's battles. Lord, and we have battles every day. There's battles going on in this room with just so many men hurting and, and just don't know where to turn. So, Father, I pray that you would comfort this man, the men in this room, the men on Zoom who are who are just at their wit's end, who want to give up. Who, who don't know what you're doing, who are quite frankly angry at you, hate what you're doing. But Father, my prayer is that these men would trust you in the midst of the hate that they have of what you're doing, the frustration of what you're doing, the unanswered prayer requests in their, in their mind. We know, God, that often you are, you are silent, but Lord, you're not absent. So I lift up a man that's hearing my voice who's just done. May they be encouraged. May you shine your face upon them. May you comfort them like nobody else can. May you give them peace that surpasses all understanding. God, we need you. Thank you for what you're doing in this room. Thank you for what you're doing with the guys on Zoom and stirring their hearts and mind. We love you, Lord. Bring us back safely next Saturday as we go hard for another 90 minutes. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks.